Awesome. Okay, what's up, Vox Gen? This is so fun. Okay, for those of you who don't realize, we are in a new series. Okay, Heaven on Earth. It's a sick graphic, you know. Yeah, okay. But for, <laughs> for those of you guys taking notes today, I'm going to get right into it. My sermon title is More Than Holiday Hope. Okay? Kind of, it kind of sounds like a little Christmas movie, you know, More Than Holiday Hope. Speaking of Christmas, who here loves Christmas? I'm with my people. Okay. I love Christmas. Okay. For so many reasons, Christmas PJs, like we're all wearing today. Okay. I mean, minus, minus me. Okay. Christmas PJs you guys are wearing. It's an excuse to wear sweats, sweatpants, and Uggs out of the house all the time. Um, Christmas lights, ice skating, Christmas in the park. Okay. But specifically the hot cocoa with a little snowman on top. Oh my gosh. I'll mess that up, bro. Freaking, I love that, okay. So it's the most wonderful time of the year, but it's also called the season of hope, which, I mean, I guess that's pretty true. Like, you know how there's all those songs where it's like hoping for snow or wishing for snow, or maybe like you're hoping for a gift, you know? Like hoping for that guitar or the low-rise Uggs or the Stanley 2.0 40-ounce in four screen. Or um, maybe you're like 13-year-old Medea who is just absolutely dying to go see Shawn Mendes in concert. Okay, tell the truth, shame the devil. Who here has like had a Shawn Mendes phase or like a Charlie Puth or One Direction, Justin Bieber phase? Yeah, yeah, raise your hands, raise your hands. Okay, thank you, thank you. I am not alone, okay? And I was, I was only like mildly obsessed with Shawn Mendes. Like, it's, it's not like I knew every lyric to every single song and cover that he did and had like all his posters and merch and his cologne and knew his birthday, his parents' names, his sister's names, where he grew up. Or it's not like my, my Roblox username is Premium Shawn Mendes, you know? Add, add me on Roblox, guys, okay? That's... Yeah, but okay, for real, my obsession was so bad that my sisters would go to the book fair and they would bring me back Shawn Mendes calendars. And those, you know those 3D posters where it's like, if you look at it like different ways, it shows like a different image. They like brought me back one every single time. That's how much they love me. Okay, so when I was 13, I was dying to go to the Shawn Mendes concert. And as every good parent, they, my parents were like, no, you're 13 and the show is in Oakland. You're not going to the Shawn Mendes concert. That did not deter me, okay, guys? I literally asked every single day leading up to the concert. Okay, day of the concert. It's looking dim. It's looking dark. It's looking like I'm not going to be able to go to this concert. My hope was fading, okay? It didn't, there, there looked like there was no way, but out of the blue, Pastor Brittany comes in. Shout out Pastor Brittany. Pastor Brittany. She's a G, okay. She was my middle school tribe leader at the time. Um, she took me and my bestie Eden to go see Shawn Mendes. Guys, I'm not even being dramatic. That was the best day of my life. Nothing's going to top that. That was the best day of my life, okay? But <laughs> you just, just like how I had to sustain hope to see the love of my life despite my current situation... Jesus also wants us to hold on to hope despite your surrounding circumstances. You, you see what I did there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, now this is your warning, guys. Now's the time to take out your notes because I'm going to be taking you through Luke 2, verses 1 through 20. And I'm going to tell you exactly why we need hope and how we hold on to it. So that's your warning, okay? We're going to start with Luke 2, 1 through 5. Let me turn my page. Okay. It says in the, oh, it's the NIV as well, by the way, for my middle school girls, okay? In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So this verse A tells us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This is also the, di whoa, the direct fulfillment of Micah 5.2, okay? So this prophecy in Micah 5.2 says that the Savior of Israel would be born in Bethlehem. That was 700 years before Jesus' birth. Can you imagine waiting for something for 700 years? Some of you guys don't even know what 15 years feels like. 
like 700. Have you guys ever asked your parents for something? They're like, oh, we'll, we'll do it next week. Or like, you know, like I'll get you, I'll get you that next month or I'll get you that next year. You're like, no, you won't. You're going to forget about it. There's no way that feels so far. Okay. Imagine that times 700. That's freaking crazy, bro. That's crazy. So Okay, but through fulfilling this prophecy that Israel's Savior would be born in Bethlehem, God shows us that he keeps his promises no matter the length of time. Okay? Write that down. Okay, that's the first one. God keeps his promises. So we know that we can trust in God because he keeps his promises. Now let's look at Luke 2, 6 through 7. It says, While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So for those of you that might know, the circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth were far from luxurious, okay? He was born in a manger. A manger is a trough, and a trough is what horses eat out of. So Jesus was born in a horse's food bowl surrounded by animals that have never been bathed a day in their life. I, I don't know about you personally, but for me, that's like a worst case scenario. I don't want to be in that environment ever, let alone be birthed or give birth in that environment. That's, that sounds horrible. But it's a perfect example of how hope isn't contingent on comfort or status. See, hope isn't dependent on the perfect timing at the perfect place. You don't have to have the perfect family or the perfect GPA or be the perfect sibling, the perfect daughter, the perfect son, the perfect athlete. You can have a hope despite your circumstances because God is not limited to your circumstances. You see, he's a, he's a really big God, okay? You know that song, like, he's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole, yeah, 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 okay. He's a big God. He's a really big God. See, he can, he can and he will use you despite your messiness. And actually, he will use you in your messiness to show you how big of a God he really is. So we can trust in God because he always keeps his promises and we don't have to be perfect for him to use us. Okay, got that. So next we're gonna move on to the announcements to the shepherds in Luke chapter two, eight through 14. And it says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that you will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you that you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. So, this angelic proclamation to the shepherds was a message of hope. The announcement of good news and of great joy, uh, and the promise of peace on earth brought hope to a world that is plagued with conflict and turmoil. So, through this, God shows us that hope is what brings peace in situations of anxiety, of worry, of uncertainty. So where it's easy to worry because your parents are constantly fighting at home and the thought of like divorce is plaguing your mind. Or maybe you're worried about your future, what college you're gonna get, go to, what college you're gonna get into, if college is even for you. Or maybe you're constantly thinking about, oh God, I want you to use me, but I don't know how you could use someone like me or what you could use me for. Or maybe you're just worried about finals because like, you just need to get through the semester and that's so real. But God shows us that the answer for this is hope because we can trust in God because he's got us, because what he promised, he will deliver on, even in the midst of our mess. And we can hold on to hope knowing God will come through, which gives us peace. So now we're gonna move on to the shepherd's response in Luke 2, 15 through 20. It says, when angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, they didn't just walk, they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So despite their initial fear, because it says that they were terrified, because no one said it's easy to have hope when everything around you feels hopeless, the shepherds responded with curiosity and faith. They actively sought out the source, okay? They didn't just step, they chased after it. They didn't let their fear stop them, okay? Because hope, hope is often realized through proactive seeking and a willingness to overcome fear and uncertainty, okay? Let me, let me say that again for all of you guys taking notes, okay? Hope is often realized through proactive seeking and a willingness to overcome fear and uncertainty, basically means don't let your fear hold you back from your breakthrough, okay? Don't let your fear be your limiting factor because it's gonna keep you in that dark place. It's gonna keep you away from all the things that God wants you to achieve because you're letting yourself sit in that dark place. You can't let that be your limiting factor. You are called to step beyond your fear. So now we understand that God makes promises and he comes through on them always that he isn't a limited God and he works despite our circumstances. We learn that hope is the cure for our worries and that we keep hope by overcoming our fear and uncertainty by stepping towards it. But how do we get hope in the first place? Okay, this is like the easiest and most tangible thing that I could give you. There's only one answer of how you can get a sustaining hope, a hope that's gonna last you your whole lifetime, not like a season, not like a, oh, just get me to the end of the semester. Oh, let me just get past this next year. Oh, let me just get into a college. Like, no, this hope is gonna last you a lifetime and there's only one place that you can get it. And it's through a personal encounter with Jesus, okay? That's the only way that you're gonna be able to get this type of hope, okay? So can everyone just stand up with me today? Okay, specifically in Luke 2, 16 through 20, we see the witnessing of the Messiah. You see, the shepherds encountered baby Jesus in the manger, and it was a profound moment of hope. They were able to witness the fulfillment of God's promises in the form of Jesus, which brought joy and confirmation of God's presence, even in the midst of all the challenging circumstances around them. You see, Maybe you find yourself in a challenging circumstance today and you're just kind of clinging on to hope. Like you only see a little bit, but you're holding on to it. Or I don't know, maybe you haven't felt hope in a long time. Like you've been in a dark place for a long time and you don't even know what hope feels like. Maybe you just need to get a little bit desperate for it again. Like you haven't seen that light in a long time. You need to get a little bit desperate for it. You need an encounter with hope because you need to feel peace. Like you've been lying awake at night, thinking and thinking and thinking. You can't get to sleep because you're thinking through all the things that you're worrying about and you just need that peace again in your life. Or maybe you're going through your day. I mean, I've been there going through your day and the things that are plaguing you are plaguing you through the day now. You can't even get through a class without thinking about the things that are worrying you. You can't get through class without thinking about your home life. You can't get through class without thinking about when am I gonna get into this school? Am I gonna get into school? Am I good enough? What's my GPA? Am I, am I gonna be able to get through this game? Am I gonna be able to, Am I even gonna be able to get through the day without thinking about these things anymore? I mean, I've been there. I've definitely been there. But for you to be able to get that peace, you need to have hope in your life again. And like I said before, it requires a step. You can't obtain hope by staying in the dark place. You need to actively step towards it. And you can't let fear be what stops you from getting to your breakthrough.